Retrofitting and finishing an existing basement is one of the most challenging aspects of renovating or remodeling an existing building, and if you get it wrong, you can end up with some serious leaks that can result in mold problems and rot, and tens of thousands of dollars in damage and remediation costs. New homes and buildings have the advantage of addressing a lot of these potential moisture issues in the design phase, whereas existing buildings don't really have this luxury. In this video, we're going to walk through successful approaches to basement retrofits for a variety of existing building conditions, and how you can eliminate your risk of leaks and moisture problems so that you have a long-lasting, comfortable, and mold-free basement. You guys requested that we do a deep dive on this, and we're going to deliver. Let's get into it. When we're addressing an existing basement, and that basement has been left uninsulated and unfinished for decades, we have to acknowledge the fact that there could have been small, inconsequential leaks in those walls that have gone unnoticed for the lifespan of the building. Those uninsulated basement walls dried out relatively quickly because there was an abundant amount of heat flow helping to dry out the basement, and because they were unfinished, we don't typically see much mold growth. Now you might see evidence of water staining, whether it's in the form of efflorescence, which are salt deposits that look like a chalky substance, or patterns of water dripping down the wall, or maybe you've observed some darkening of any exposed wood studs or damp spots. These are all very common building conditions in an old basement, as it was expected that there would be some incidental water that got in, and the assumption was that it was okay because things dried out. But basements weren't really treated as fully furnished, livable spaces until the last few decades, and so when we go to finish these spaces and upgrade them to our current comfort standards, we can run into a lot of issues if we don't address moisture prior to insulating and finishing the basement. And so moisture is coming from several different sources. As we mentioned, we have bulk water that leaks into the foundation walls that can drive water into the basement through cracks and gaps as a result of hydrostatic pressure against the basement walls. This is the weight of water exerting itself against the basement and trying to find any areas where it can leak inside, and this is typically a result of poor drainage around the foundation and saturated soils. We also have to deal with groundwater rise, and this is especially the case if your basement floor is located close to the level of the water table. And so if you have water collecting around the foundation during or after a period of precipitation, you can see dampness in the basement slab or seepage through the joint between the slab and the foundation wall. We have to deal with capillarity as well. This is moisture transport through porous materials like concrete and brick in which they readily wick and absorb water, and they have a tendency to redistribute that water to any other porous materials that are in direct contact. That's why we ideally want capillary breaks at the footing and between any wooden components, as we often see wood components deteriorate if they're in direct contact with the concrete or masonry without a capillary break. We also have to deal with condensation both on the masonry walls and on the backside of the interior finishes. If we have warm, humid air being generated from the interior conditioned space that's coming into contact with the colder basement walls, we're going to get condensation. This first appears as capillary condensation within the pores of the concrete or masonry, but we can actually see surface condensation forming as well, and that condensation will drip down the wall and raise relative humidity levels within the wall cavity and provide a breeding ground for mold. We also have to deal with moisture drying out of the basement walls to the interior, and if there's substantial moisture in those existing basement walls, we can actually get condensation forming on the backside of our drywall or interior finishes, and so we may need to slow down the rate of drying. If you have a masonry or rubble basement in a colder climate, moisture within the basement walls can cause freeze-thaw damage, especially if you're insulating those walls from the interior, as the masonry walls are kept much colder. And so what happens with freeze-thaw damage is that the dissolved salts in the absorbed water are left behind and concentrated when the water freezes, and these salt concentrations can be very damaging to masonry if there is a constant flow of moisture, as osmotic pressure pressures can be exerted onto the masonry, causing spalling, in which it basically falls off. So these are the sources of moisture that we have to address prior to even thinking about insulating and finishing a basement. With that said, how do we go about addressing these sources of moisture? Well, it all starts with drainage and controlling bulk water and surface water on the building and on the site, and directing it away from the foundation so that we prevent the surface water from becoming subsurface water and groundwater. We want to make sure that we have functional gutters so that we're collecting the water that falls on the roof and not draining the water around the perimeter of the foundation. We also want to make sure that all of our downspouts are being directed away from the foundation walls and discharged to a stormwater facility that's on-site or off-site. We need to make sure that we're sloping the grade away from the foundation walls, and while all of this sounds very basic, oftentimes the ground settles around the foundation and we end up with divots or depressions in the ground that can cause water to collect around these areas of the basement and challenge the integrity of any waterproofings, and so we want to make sure that the site is graded away from the basement. Now let's say we're dealing with a challenging site and we can't adequately slope the grade away from the basement walls. There are some strategies that we can use such as installing a French drain at the surface to intercept any water that's draining towards the basement walls, but ideally we want to try to address as much surface 
water as possible by just grading the site in a way that keeps water away from the building. Now, when it comes to controlling water and preventing leaks, drainage is going to be our best friend, and we're going to want to prioritize draining the basement walls, as drainage and drainage gaps will prevent the buildup of hydrostatic pressure that drives water into cracks and gaps in the foundation. And so we can address drainage either from the exterior or from the interior. In most retrofit applications, we have to address drainage from the interior because excavating around the foundation walls is usually cost prohibitive and messy work, but we're going to discuss both options. Let's talk about interior drainage first and what this looks like. We have these leaky foundation walls. We can't just apply a waterproof coating like dry lock to the interior and call it good. We need an actual strategy to deal with water as hydrostatic pressure will drive water through any cracks and imperfections in those walls and new cracks naturally tend to form in the concrete and masonry, especially if the walls are getting wet. We need to retrofit a drainage mat against the foundation walls that's directed to a new interior French drain system and discharged to a sump pump. This essentially mirrors what we would already do on the exterior side, except with a few modifications. First, we need to excavate around the perimeter of the slab to install the new interior drainage pipe. This drainage pipe should be located below the level of the slab by a few inches, set in a bed of clean crushed stone and wrapped in filter fabric. This is really similar to what we would do on the exterior. Now we need to direct this interior drainage pipe to a sump pump, or even better, two sump pumps in the event that one fails, and sometimes you simply need more than one sump pump if you have an especially large basement, or if you're located in an area with a higher water table. But it's better to rely on more than just one sump pump in terms of providing redundancy. We also want to make sure that these sump pumps have backup batteries in the event that there's a power outage during a strong storm, pretty much when you need the sump pumps the most. If your power goes out, you still want your sump pumps to be operational. Now it's critical that these sump pumps are being discharged away from the basement walls to a dry well or a stormwater facility that's downslope at the basement. You don't want water being discharged right back around your foundation since this would make the problem substantially worse. So get rid of the water and have it drain as far away from the basement as possible. Then we need to install our drainage membrane, in this case a taped dimple mat. The dimple mat is installed over the existing foundation walls and should lap and extend over the new French drain, so any water that leaks through those basement walls will simply be directed to the French drain. The taped dimple mat not only provides the benefits of drainage, but it serves as an uncoupling layer by providing a capillary break, an air barrier, and a vapor retarder, preventing moisture from drying into the basement and helping to control interior relative humidity. It's also useful for preventing efflorescence, subfluorescence, and spalling on the interior side of these older masonry and rubble buildings, as the dimple mat will prevent evaporation that causes these salt deposits to form after each cycle of wetting and drying. In essence, the below grade masonry walls stay damp. It's okay if the masonry and stone and concrete is damp, as long as it's uncoupled from the rest of the wall assembly and not touching any moisture sensitive materials. We need to seal the top of the dimple mat to make sure it's airtight, whether it's with air sealing tape, canned foam, or something else, but we need to make sure it's airtight. Finally, we need to patch the concrete covering the top of the dimple mat and ensuring it's flush with the existing slab. Now, this strategy works for a lot of different foundation types, but there's a couple of niche building conditions where you'll need to use a different strategy. The first building condition is if you're dealing with a monolithic basement slab, where the slab and the footings have been cast as one continuous unit, with a CMU block wall that's bearing on top of the footings. You can't cut into the slab to retrofit an interior drainage strategy, as this would compromise the structural integrity of the slab. You can either address waterproofing and drainage from the exterior, which is what I would recommend in this case, or on the interior using a very specific strategy that involves uncoupling the slab from the finished floor and integrating a sealed drainage channel above the slab that gets discharged to a sump. We do have some details in our basement design ebook for this type of building condition. The other building condition is for a permanent wood foundation. We absolutely have to keep these wooden components as dry as possible, and so we need to provide our waterproofing and our drainage on the outside of the structure. This can make renovating and insulating these types of foundations quite labor-intensive and expensive, since you'll need to excavate around the foundation walls to access the walls of the permanent wood foundation, but it's the only way to ensure long-term durability. If you're looking for a complete guide on how to build a dry, comfortable, and durable basement, get my guide to basement design only available at asiri-designs.com shop. In this guide, we discuss everything from waterproofing and drainage techniques, insulating, condensation control, egress wells, HVAC considerations, and more. Links will be in the description below. We also have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Give this video a like if you haven't already, and subscribe for more weekly building science videos. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.